Hello, and welcome to Who Knew, a Doctor Who podcast. I am your host, Josh Carr, and with me today we have a, a merging of podcasts yet again, and it's it's a it's a time space event that will forever be remembered because. AMTV Radio is in the house. Hey. It's the one and only Adam Martin. How Hello. are you? Hey man, I'm I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. On. It's so weird. Like when you were like, "Welcome to the Who Knew Podcast," I was like, "Oh my god!" Because I've, I've been listening since day one. So oh, to, to be on it is, now is you know smiles. That <laughs> makes my heart feel happy. <laughs> so thank you very much. But no problem. I mean. It, it's you know well we're, we're, we're both podcast royalty i don't mean that that was a joke please don't don't take that seriously people <laughs> um but it is it's great to talk to you i'm very very excited for this one um i say that every week i always say i've got a fantastic guest but it's like it's like the podcast way isn't it like, it is, there, there but, are certain things you just you mean it of course you mean it but there are just like certain things isn't it that you just yeah i mean say. but you i'm not good at much but i always i always fucking deliver on the guests yeah, like, i deliver yeah. <laughs> i am the postman yeah um, <laughs> so we're here to talk about doctor who yeah um naturally because mm. this is a doctor who podcast and i mean the well where better place to start as always than with yourself, Adam Martin. Where did it all begin? Where, where oh. did Doctor Who begin for you? Well, I'm I'm sure my origins are probably similar to a lot of people my age in like the 20s. So I'll try and make it as interesting as possible. But um, so context: uh, I was born in 1996. Great year, great year. And uh, great year. before 2005, I literally had no idea what Doctor Who was. I was never exposed to it um if it well if it was on tv i didn't recognize it you know i didn't know the importance of what a police box was or what a dalek looked like i had zero idea and then um we got the that trailer you know do you want to come with me christopher eccleston and uh, i think i can't remember why we were all watching something as a family and i can't, can't think what but we were all watching the telly and that came on and you know you watch it you watch the trailer and then when it said, oh, Doctor Who coming back, my dad, who watched the original series, went, oh, they're bringing Doctor Who back. And then he looked at me and said, oh, you, you're you you're probably the right age. You know, you, you'll like this, because I was nine at the time, which I think is a peak age to get into Doctor yeah. Who, about nine. So definitely, sure enough, uh, 26th of March that year, rolled around. We, we sat on down, uh, Rose started, and 45 minutes later, I was like, yeah. I like this show, man. Let's do it. And then series one plowed through that. And th- this might make me sound old. We didn't have like digital recorders yet in our house, you know, like sky boxes and stuff. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even have a sky box. We only had the four, well, I say four channels. We couldn't even get channel five because of the signal. <laughs> um, so when I wanted to start recording Doctor Who, I did the good old VHS tapes. So I'd load up oh, my VHS nice. on broadcast, hit play. And then when I rewatch it, you know, I'd catch the end of the news at the start or like the start of the next program. But I think I remember Bad Wolf in particular, the penultimate one. I remember because obviously that was such a big cliffhanger moment, wasn't it? Like, you know, the mm-hmm. Daleks are back and yeah. the Doctor's going to get Rose. It's like, oh, my God. what's And I, I kid you not, every day from that week from 12 to 13... I watched that episode on tape. As soon as I come in from school, I went in the living room, put in the VCR and just watched Bad Wolf seven times before the parting of the ways. Wow. And it was honestly that first series, like it's not my favorite series like overall, but in terms of like pure, you know, magic and obviously getting into it, like Mm. it holds such a special place because that I think for a lot of us, you know, that series made us fans. Like it was such a crucial series that needed to obviously get it right for the the older fans as well but Mm. like i'd argue more importantly for the new ones coming in and it just it absolutely slapped i mean so many of you guests have said it before but it does it's it's just such a belter of a series and chris eccleston is is a a gorgeous human being but he's also a gorgeous actor and um yeah yeah i mean it's it's it it is a, a case of i mean 
because your, your experience is exactly the same as mine yeah and exactly the same as a lot of other guests that we've had where <laughs> I mean we've had we've had a lot of times I'm sure you'll know where that trailer has been brought up it's it's iconic in yeah in the who knew arena it's it's you know one for the ages yeah um it's interesting you said like VHS tapes that is a that is a deep memory because I I had this thing the first couple of series of Doctor Who um I've I've always been one for missing big events I'm a bit of a donner <laughs> where okay. I I always just miss out on on the big bits hmm. so um my usual time for a family holiday would always fall on the series finale of Doctor Who. Oh no. And even still to this day, things still usually line up. I never usually get to watch a series finale oh, on broadcast. <laughs> like it, it never happens. I, I remember like three occasions where it's happened, I think, out of 12 series. <laughs> but um yeah, that is the only the only episode that I've ever seen on VHS was parting of the ways mad so you, <laughs> you you can imagine like the fact that i i saw bad wolf and then i didn't know anything about regeneration i didn't yeah, know same. anything and then i come back two weeks later run straight to my grandma's house she's recorded parting of the ways for me yeah and i sit on the floor so i have missed all of the news about the Doctor regenerating. <laughs> and my first experience is watching this fuzzy VHS yeah, and just seeing David Tennant pop up on the screen like, what the he, fuck? Absolutely. Do you know what? It's, it's so weird because, again, like yourself, throughout the whole of Series 1, and I'd love to sort of remember what that felt like, throughout all of Series 1, the Doctor was just Chris Eccleston. Like, mm. that was it. I had no idea that you know, there were other doctors. And like you said, when David Tennant came on, it's like, I remember saying to my dad, I was like, who's he? Like, what's what's going on? I mean, if only we knew, because David Tennant's like massive now. But, yeah. um, and then my dad again was like, oh, well, you know, he said there were other actors who played the doctor. And I was like, well, how does that work? And uh, for, I think soon after that, there's a book called Monsters and Villains. Oh, um, great. Book. Which is my, I'd argue, is one of the most important Doctor Who books ever because I completely agree. Because it was it, like, it, it looked like a new series book, you know, it had Eccleston on the cover and the new Dalek, and all the text was like the 2005 font sort of thing. But then I remember opening like the first few pages, and there's the Cybermen, and I'm like, what are these things? And then it's like, oh, they they first appeared with the first Doctor. I'm like, f f first, first Doctor? And it was just, so it was that book, I think, where I got a lot of like my early I, classic I knowledge. I mean, I don't remember exactly, but I imagine it's probably the same because mm. I, I know that I got that book pretty much as soon as it came out. Yeah. So <laughs> it was, it was very early on. Yeah. So I imagine it was probably my first exposure to classic who. Absolutely. That, like reading through that. Um, and then I remember we did this, it, it, it would have been probably just, just coming up to series two, mm. I imagine, where at school they wanted us to do a project just about, I, I don't even know what the theme was, but I obviously went, well, I'm going to do a project on Doctor Who. Yeah. So I, I got to sit down on this big big bulky computer like proper white I know the ones. screens <laughs> yeah um big bulky computer and just read through every wikipedia entry about doctor who and then essentially i mean essentially copy and paste it yeah. um but i just remember this one saturday sitting and reading and writing about all of the doctors and all mm. of the companions and all of the masters and canine and the Daleks ah. and the Cybermen. And I just learned so much. And it's like, oh, just get it gets me emotional talking about it. But it's like that was when Doctor Who went from this program that I liked to this obsession 
that I still have today, obviously. Yeah. Um, because I'm here yeah. 16 years later <laughs> doing this. 16 uh, years, rah. Like, I mean, smart, isn't it? I, I'd love that. Like you said, I'd love to sort of remember what it felt like to learn it all again, if that makes sense. Because I remember yeah. how joyous it was. Like my first time watching classic Doctor Who, because back then I think people forget DVDs were quite expensive on their own still. Mm. Like, and I got, it was the three Doctors as my first classic Who. So imagine my surprise, like, you know, it's not all one episode, it's four parts. Like what? And the, and there's there's three of them and and this is happening and that's, but even though, you know, the three doctors now, you, you, you look at it and you say, oh, yeah, the, the gel guards are a bit shit and like this, that and the other. But as a nine year old watching it, like none of that was in my mind. It was like the imagination of it was so, you know, vast, obviously stuff in like black hole, antimatter, this other time lord. Like it was epic. Yeah, it was so epic as a nine year old to to watch that. And then whenever I could save enough pocket money and with whatever DVDs were out, I'd gradually pick up more i think some early ones i remember the five doctors i gravitated towards the multi-doctor ones i think i thought well there's there's more doctors in them so they must be the best ones um mm. yeah that was one and uh i think resurrection of the daleks as well uh, a lot of the 80s dalek stuff just anything i could get my hands on really i just wanted yeah. to soak it all up yeah see i think i think there's a couple of sweet spots for classic who i think if you come at it at the wrong age Mm. then you could be put off for life yeah so right. i i think i was probably one of those where right. i came at it like mid teens was probably okay. the first time yeah and like funny you know, time of life the mid teens <laughs> the mid teens is uh, as strange as it is but like my first exposure i think would have been um pyramids of mars Mm, it's a great okay. story and i i enjoyed watching it but i was like yeah if this is the best <laughs> like, oh no <laughs> can i can i get through this yeah yeah but i, I just couldn't really appreciate it i sure. think if you come at it as a kid you just have that thing where it's like it's just doctor who and it's more doctor who and yeah. you're not you don't really think about special effects and stuff like, it actually made me a bit sad the other day um, I said the other day, this is probably like two or three years ago, but I was watching a film with my nephews and they were like, oh God, that those special effects look so rubbish. Oh, and I'm no. like, mate, you're seven. Just oh, lose God, yourself seven. in it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Just, just let her rip. You, you want them you to know? have the wonder. Like, I remember, like, you know, chatting with people, watch Classic Coup and they were like, oh, yeah, the McCoy years, they were like, skip them. Like, com- like, and they weren't just saying, you know, one or two, they were like, all of it. They were like, it's all rubbish. So when I went into Remembrance and I was like, this story's really fucking good. <laughs> I don't know mm. what everyone's on about. And then I think, again, watching it so young helped me watch other stories that were like maligned in the community. But I just looked at them for like, if they entertained me, if I had fun, then that was all that really mattered. And that's something where I've tried to carry that through now as an adult. Like I'll be there to analyze it, of course. But sometimes mm. if I just want to have fun with Doctor Who, like I know my, I know which stories I can go to like a guilty pleasure is the invasion of time you know from yeah. season 15 like yes yes it's ropey yes the tardis interior sets in a disused hospital look a bit naff and but it's just i just find it so much fun do you know what i mean i can yeah. breeze through that and it's just well, a, an episode that's in the dvd collection i noticed uh, yes yeah. so see it's people the, it's, it's not all in that the bad. dvd collection <laughs> um yeah it was it was probably my first pick where i went I didn't go, yeah, so um, <laughs> okay, Billy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was an interesting one. It was an yeah. interesting one. Um, I mean, nothing about uh, Sam Davis putting the caretaker in was, I mean, just blew, blew me away. Yeah. I was like, that I mean, was a it, peculiar pick. It's an odd one because, like, in terms of, obviously, I'll be careful with how I say it here, like, the way... The way Capaldi performs it, like as an actor, as a performer, I th- I personally think is really like fucking good. I mean, he's good anyway, but I think he nails it there. Obviously, like the story is not perfect and um, the writer and all that sort mm. of stuff. But yes, yeah, so it did surprise yeah. me. But then in the end, I thought, but fair play if, if Sam, you know, got what he got out of it. That's great. Well, we like, we, you we know. spoke about it and he, I, I, I like his, I liked his justification, which was like, he loves 
episodes and i i know that you've done the, the commentary with him about yeah. twin dilemma yeah and it's like he loves <laughs> and i've spoken to him about this privately as well he just loves episodes that you can talk about like yeah there's no there's nothing worse to him than an episode that you just have nothing to say and it's yeah. like no matter what you say about the caretaker i he i think he agreed with me that it's not great yeah but we had a it's, we had a great conversation about it. It was really interesting. So yeah. I mean, yeah, it's what you take from Doctor Who stories. Mm. I'm the same as you, where it's like I, I mean, I, I struggle to look at, at Doctor Who objectively mm. because I just love it all for for completely different reasons. You know, yeah. there, there's some that I love because I genuinely think like this is a masterpiece of of television making. And oh, the yeah. song that I love because this is a disaster piece of television <laughs> making. And it's just so fun to watch. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, like my guilty pleasures. I, I think I've said on the podcast before, I think I, mm-hmm. I, when, I, when I was talking about it with Sam, Time Lash. Oh, really? Okay. I love, okay. I love Time do Lash. Yeah. That's really brilliant do. though. Yeah. I, I mean, the fact that you do warms my heart because... I watched that recently with the aim of like, you know, I'm going to give this a second chance. I'm going to see what I think. And like, I don't think it's as bad as people say it is, but I don't think I enjoyed it as much as I wanted to. So yeah, that's great that you, that you love it. I just love uh, it. It's everything that I thought classic who would be (laughs) in the, (laughs) in the best and worst way possible. Like, and it, I, I've had this conversation before as well, but it's like there's five out. Of, I think I think a, a one out of ten is better and more enjoyable to watch than a five out of ten. Easy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So Terminus, five out of ten. <laughs> I don't uh. want to watch that story again because it yeah. bored me. But mm. Time Lash, two out of ten. Yeah. One of my favourites of the year. <laughs> Paul Darrow doing his Richard the Third, hell yeah! Oh, it's so <laughs> no, yeah. good. It's so hammy, so so I, hammy. I think Terminus is a funny one because that was another one I rewatched the whole Black Guardian trilogy recently because I thought I'm being quite hard on season twenty. I was like, I need to rewatch some of this. Terminus, I feel, is one of those cases. It's it's that classic who thing of I think part one is really interesting and really sets things up decently, like the atmosphere of what it's going for, and yeah. then the rest just fault like doesn't work same with like uh you know like the space museum part one um yeah and, part, and, and some of those mixed that's in there. the biggest the biggest dip for, well i mean you could argue an unearthly child all that as well yeah, well, yeah <laughs> like an unearthly child i think it's widely regarded i know it has its fans but i think the general consensus is part one is 10 it, out of 10 yeah and then everything else is sort of and then skip yeah. straight to the Daleks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the, the Space Museum, Hartnell's on fire in part one. He is, yeah. he is so good in part one. And that that finale, uh, yeah. that, that final moment where he got out and we've arrived. Oh, so gives good. Me, gives me goosebumps. Um, well, I mean, well, a lot of tangents. I, I thought... <laughs> tonight would would bring a lot of tangents i love but it man <laughs> i love it too but let's chat about mm. youtube okay. so you've been doing youtube for about eight years i want to say yes yes about eight years now so what age would that have made you then what what, what, what are we talking like i 16, was a, 17 i was a young 16 year old uh i had oh, recently <laughs> i'd recently gotten a this a samsung galaxy s2 like right back near the start which which back then which back then children was the it was like the top of the range phone with like the camera i think it was like eight megapixels which today sounds really pitiful and awful but back <laughs> then back in 2012 like that was the shit do you know what i mean that was yeah. the phone you wanted and i remember playing around with the video and thought hang on like i could do <laughs> i could make a youtube video because now i have a i have a decent camera and then I thought, right, cool. Because, you know, I watched a lot of YouTube and I was like, I, I, I'll have a go at this. And I thought, right, what can I do? 
So I pointed my camera at my Doctor Who DVD shelf, uh, turned the flash on for some fucking reason. <laughs> and so you got this glare throughout the whole thing. And I think uttered the immortal words like, hi there, guys, for the first time. I didn't know what I was doing, man. I literally just went through it's the most boring video ever. Like, you know, it's that thing of here's what I've got. An unearthly child slide back in. The Daleks slide back in. The edge just and so on and so forth. Yeah. And uh, this was back in the day as well when if I think if you were brand new to like YouTube making videos, you could only do 10 minute videos. Do you remember that old like limitation? I don't so even I, remember that. Oh, yeah. so instead of doing one video, I had to do, I think it was in, I think it was in four parts. I didn't even have that many DVD. I think I just chatted about each story. So it was like four parts, which are still there. I don't care if people want to go watch them. They're there. Um, all my stuff's still there, I think. So I'd say for the first two years, it was very sporadic. It wasn't consistent. You know, I wasn't doing it thinking, oh, I'm going to grow a channel. I think I just did mm. it because I thought it'd be fun and I enjoyed it. So I did that for about two years and then uni happened. So that really put a, I began the saga, as I call it, of doing like, you know, update videos where it's like, sorry, there's not been a video for six months, but don't worry, <laughs> I'm starting back up again six yeah. months later. Sorry, I've been away for six months, but don't worry, I'm starting back. And then um, I think it was in the, the last summer between second and third year. So before my final year of uni, I thought mm -hmm. I want to make like a little documentary video. And I can't remember what, in, I don't know if anyone inspired me. I can't remember like a particular thing inspiring me, but I've always had a fascination with like classic TV and like the history mm. of British TV in particular. And I thought, well, I roughly know the origins of the like five main terrestrial channels. Why don't I try and do something on that? So um, it was the first time I used iMovie, which is a hilariously basic software, but I fucking love it. Um, and uh, I mean, I make i make my videos on iMovie same mate same yeah like, I'd say I'm, like it's not perfect and like yes i know people say like there's bugs and there's issues but i think you know for just making videos it's really it's really good efficient software i think for yeah the most part. for so making something it. simple it's yeah it's just like like my obviously my videos for the podcasts are pretty basic because i don't have like video or anything but yeah like you, you can just make a video in in like 15 20 minutes it's it's so yeah. nice and, and i'm pretty and sure easy. that's how long it, it took me to make this documentary <laughs> it's like it's now now i look back it's not very good like at the time i was dead chuffed with it because i'd never made anything like it before so i think the fact that i'd made it i was like hell yeah like i did this um and then it weirdly like blew up like for, for my channel anyway and then i thought oh well i'll do more classic tv stuff so i always say from like the summer of 2016 was when i started taking youtube a bit more seriously if you like or like making mm. more videos and uh um yeah and then it, it was really classic tv for a long while you know um, i had a series called the ident review which i made like nearly 90 episodes of at this point where i just look at for anyone who doesn't know you know like before a program starts and they'll go this is bbc one and it will be like the hippos or whatever it is that's an ident and uh, i would just review them across different channels because i found it interesting and it again it weirdly blew up and i was like who is I'm like, who is I, watching this like yeah, well it's it's something that <clears throat> i mean obviously no offense no go for it yeah no, go for it like when i saw it i was like videos about idents that's yeah that's 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 a niche market yeah and then, definitely and then i find myself like 15 episodes deep and i'm like i'm loving this <laughs> this is great <laughs> like it's it's such addictive because that's something that that strikes me about you is that you know we, we've had a lot of a lot of well, quite a lot of youtubers on at this point you know we've had sam davis and, yeah. and miss tardis and ace creeper and they're all very much predominantly Doctor Who YouTubers. Yeah. I don't think we've had anyone who varies it up <laughs> as much as you do. Like yeah. the other day, uh, I know that we were chatting on, in the chat on the premiere of your Charlie Says video. Oh, like yeah. <laughs> infomercials from the, the 70s. Yeah. Like really like niche british tv history <laughs> but it, it's so fun like i really would recommend i mean the charlie says one is it's hilarious because those those videos oh man they're are just <laughs> a little bit fucked like just, they just are a tiny ass. bit 
yeah, yeah, just a tiny bit. It's that it's that wonderful period, I think, of British animation where if ever they attempted something, like they clearly didn't have a budget and they were just like, well, we've, we've got to make something. And no matter how cursed it looks, they were just like, yeah, that'll that's fine, you know. But it's it stuck around. Like, you know, the, I remember my, my girlfriend's mum, when that video went out, she watched it and she was like, I remember those, you know, like they were played in cinemas and you did go around yeah, and go well, like oh charlie says you know so i remember that i don't know where i remember them from <laughs> but i have definitely seen all of those before yeah. and like it must have been at school or something yeah. I, don't, I don't know but well some of those old ones i mean I, I did another series called video scaries which is on similar lines but m- looks at i guess public information films or adverts or whatever that, t- that, that again like a bit fucked but are also a bit scary a bit weird because I remember mm. um, in school, like, I must have been about seven, like year three, and we were doing a day about like electricity safety. And they showed us this video, which I've, I've found since, like the exact one. I think they made it in like 1988. So that it was already like 15 years old. But, um, you know, it's the classic thing. Oh, we're playing football. The ball's gone into the power station. Let's climb over and get the ball. And um, I always, I'll never forget because it gave me nightmares as well. Like I remember the shot. It's like the shot of the girl outside looking in and she's like, uh, be careful. And then you hear like a sort of mini explosion. And now you think, oh, you know, they won't, they won't show anything, you know, it'll stay on the girl or whatever. But then they cut to this, this boy's charred body, like face, like hands, like he's, he's dead, like instantly dead. And Obviously, when you're seven years old and you see that shit, wow, that's fucking. And the teacher's like, "Yeah, you see, this is why you." Sh-. I mean, yeah, it hits the message home. But I was like, "My God, like, I mean, it's it's mad." I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm starting to realize. I think we really are probably one of the last generations who will grow up seeing some really fucked up shit. Yeah, well, I mean, it's also controlled like on now, TV, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's very controlled. And I mean, probably the kids of today see enough fucks up shit just from That's true, the yeah. real world. Um, but like I was saying the other day that, you know, I I think I was saying it's Joe Lidster. Like, mm. I I was nine when I watched The Children of Earth. <laughs> oh, man, that is... <laughs> that, that's not good. No, well, that that's... Is, a- that's a weird one with torture because I, I never watched series one and two. I've only watched them for the first time in like the last two weeks, which is so oh, weird really? for me. Yeah. Wow. Cause when they went out, I was, uh, Ill, no, I was 10 and then 12. And I think, well, series one, we didn't have BBC three. Cause again, it was the whole digital channel thing. So that was, that was a no go, but we did get digital by the time series two came around. And I remember asking my parents, I was like, Oh, can I watch Torchwood? It's like a Doctor Who spin-off. But they probably smartly looked into it. And, it, you know, it says, obviously, it's a, it's an adult drama. It's like 15 and up. And they were like, yeah. no. And obviously, at the time, I was like, no, what do you mean? Like, all my friends are watching Torchwood. But it, in hindsight, like, I do get it. Because having now watched series one and two, I'm like, yeah, it's it's probably a good, good idea that probably I didn't watch this idea. as a 10-year-old, you know. I mean, I've just I've just realised I did make that sound slightly worse than, than it was. Because I wasn't nine. I did the maths, maths wrong. I was 11. That's fair. I mean, still, 11 is still, still young. You yeah. know, yeah. I was I was technically in primary school. Yeah. So, But still, know. Children of Earth has some pretty adult yeah. moments, you know. Like, I mean, and, for... and that means, actually, because I watched Children of Earth knowing the characters. Yeah, yeah. So I must have seen series one and two. Okay. At least yeah. some of it. Oh man, that's fucked up. Why did I, <laughs> I, this this explains a lot. You know? <laughs> Ch- my own same head, mate, childhood traumas weird, we had. This is what I'm we British weird. kids have to go through. If they don't show you in school, you end up watching it at home. Like it's just yeah, man. it's honestly crazy. Yeah. And I mean, Torchwood, you, when I watched it, I was actually quite surprised how because obviously it's now you're know, like 15 years old, and I'm watching it for the first time as an adult, I'm like, oh, I'm probably going to find this, you know, like a bit ropey here and there or whatever. But I was surprised at how how good it all was, like binging yeah, through it. I like, say, I, yeah. I binged through it a couple of times. I did it I did it all the way through last year mm. again. And yeah, I really, really, and I still really, really love those first two series. I yeah. know that there's a, a few episodes that are ropey <laughs> and like Small Worlds, is not good it's, i mean even 
Oh, this is this is something that I just want to mention. Well, because you've just watched it for the first time, mm. the bravery on Joe Lidster. I don't know if anyone um, picked up on this, but he, um, yeah, he, he yes. said he <laughs> said that he went for a meeting to essentially secure his place on the writing team for series two of Torchwood. <laughs> with Russell T Davies and Julie Gardner. And he went, yeah, I love Torchwood, apart from Small Worlds. <laughs> <laughs> and that is apparently what pretty much got him the writing gig. He thinks that, you know, the bravery of, like, going to the to Russell T Davies and going, yeah, I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. It's so true, though. Like, you, we should just be able to... Because I've been in this situation, like, when, when you're acting and stuff for auditions, there's this horrible... Mm like backseat pressure that you've got to be like very like over complimentary, you know, very positive about everything where, you know, it's almost like if I offer any criticism, no matter how constructive, like I've basically buggered the audition and it shouldn't be like that. Like if, if you've got a problem with something or, you know, if you want to air something, you should have that freedom to air it. So for Joe's case, I was, you know, fair play, like good on him. Yeah. Good on him. Well, that's, that's what I wanted to talk about. So you're, Mm. you're also an actor. Yes what's what's that like i mean especially uh, <laughs> the minute, it's, again it's, here's here's that pre- i want to say oh yeah it's brilliant it's no i mean it, it's it's a weird one because um i think i was very lucky that my my pet both my parents and my teachers made me aware of how difficult it is if that makes sense like i wanted to be an actor from uh, since i was a kid and, um, you know, like what it is when you're a kid, obviously you think, oh, yeah, when I grow up, I'm going to go to Hollywood yeah. and I'm going to be in all the films. I'll yeah, be well, like... that, that was always my dream. That was, yeah. I mean, I used to, most kids would be like running around, like pretending to be a footballer or yeah. pretending to be someone. I would literally spend my time like, in front of a mirror pretending <laughs> to do my Oscars acceptance speech. Oh, bless you, mate. Hey, cause... one day, one day. So, wonder if we never day. know we yeah. never know we do but, know we but, do um if i flesh you no i don't hold out on your dreams and you go for it but uh yeah as i as i got older you know you do the usual things like i did gcse drama and a level drama and stuff and obviously in a level there was the talk of are you going to audition for drama school and i'll always say like if you want anyone listening if you want to be an actor you don't have to go to drama school i don't think it's as you know important as a prerequisite as it was 40 50 years ago um but if you feel it's right for you go for it but drama school is insanely competitive but you know how i'm not putting unis down but from what my mates said like with unis like some for some unis you don't necessarily you know it's like because it's based on grades isn't it so you might get x amount of grades and then you get in uh, hmm. grades basically don't mean shit at drama school which is what you're studying for at a level so it's like a contradiction like you're doing your a levels but it's not yeah. going to help you just go in a room for two minutes and act and and that alone determines whether they basically put you in or not and there's multiple stages and they cost they're not free if any drama schools are listening it's still a big problem um but they're not free and you know when you're a 17 year old with limited income it's it's tough um but i was i was very lucky to get in in my first year at a place called lipper in liverpool the liverpool institute for performing arts and yeah. i i loved it like it's liverpool is a is a wonderful city to live in and um the training i got was insane like i learned so much i grew so much as a as a person and um but it was also very intense you know like you'd be rehearsing or doing classes nine in the morning till six every day you know my mates are there like Oh, I've got an I've got a lecture at, at 1 p.m. Like, what's that about? I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> I've, just, yeah. I've, got, I've got to haul my ass out of bed at half seven after a night out on the weekend. But you know, um, but yeah, very intense. And I'd say, you know, I think the problem is because I, I ended up sitting on the auditions after I left, just as like a advisor or whatever. Um, and the amount of 17-year-olds who come in and you can sort of tell that they haven't been told how much they have to fight for this if that makes sense 
Yeah. Like that's a big, a big thing. Cause my teachers were like, it's insanely competitive. Most schools only take 30 kids out of like thousands a year. Um, actors are often unemployed. You'll get rejected for auditions. And, you know, when you hear that as a teenager, like we said, your mid teens are a, are a funny time. And you know, if you get all that laid on you, I completely understand why some people might be like, Oh, well fuck that then. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But yeah. um, for whatever insane reason, I was like, yeah, fuck it. Let's, let's face all that. But um I think, yeah, you, you have to be somewhat comfortable with rejection. Like if um, it, it's okay to feel bummed out if you don't get something like that's, that's completely fair. Mm. But if you fundamentally like can't accept it, then you probably shouldn't be, be an actor. I mean, I mean that in the nicest way possible to anyone listening, but um, yeah, doing it professionally, um, it, it, it's hit or miss, you know, like sometimes you get lucky uh, you just got to keep at it and make your own stuff like what we do on YouTube. You know, like recently mm-hmm. I've, I don't, I've gotten more work in the last few years based off what I do on YouTube. Funnily enough, like people are taking notice of yeah. YouTube. Like this, you know, they say, Oh, I've got a YouTube channel. They go, Oh, right. What, you know, can we see some stuff? And they're like, Oh yeah, we, we really like that. Do you want to read in for this? So, you know, YouTube's not a bad, I feel YouTube years ago, like when I started was sort of like that dirty word. It's like, Oh, you do you do youtube like oh you're one of those like weirdos yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. whereas i mean there's probably still a tiny bit of that now but i feel now it's become more of like an accepted thing like a side a side thing yeah no i i completely agree i mean yeah. i i think it's it, it's also a good way of just seeing how people actually are like you you know it, you're you're portfolio like of stuff on youtube shows you like it shows like the stuff that you want to make and it shows you probably a much more natural place Mm. than like an acting portfolio would because you know a lot of that work is you know it might be obviously you audition for what you want to audition for but i imagine that sometimes it's a case of taking a role that maybe you didn't really want because you might need the work yeah yeah absolutely and like typecasting is still very much a thing in the industry and the whole um like looks first talent second is very much still a big thing in the industry you know you could Mm. be the you could be the greatest actor in the world but if you're not like what they've got in their mind's eye it doesn't matter and like, you know, there's there's a lot of push in the industry anyway for, you know, several changes, not just that. I mean, representation needs to change, you know, like in terms of uh, color, um, religion, uh, d- disabilities, you know, what I mean, all that needs to shift. Like it is shifting, mm-hmm. but more needs to be done. So I hope that continues. But um, but what I'd also say is, though, if you are if you if you have a disability in particular, use it like I'm for those who don't know, I'm visually impaired. Um, I was born with cataracts, so my vision is not as good as standard vision. Um, but before the pandemic, I was due to play um, the lead in a new musical called No Horizon, which is a um, a true story about a Yorkshire lad called Nicholas Saunderson, who was around in the late 16, early 1700s, uh, from Yorkshire, blind from the age of one, but he had an insane gift for maths. And it was all about his journey. And he eventually became the head maths professor at Cambridge of all places, like following from like Isaac Newton and things like that. And this is, this is a real guy. Like there's a statue of him there, but no one knew about him. So that was like going to be this great thing to tell. And I remember seeing the casting and it said, we want someone who's from Yorkshire. So I was like, okay, tick. We want someone who ideally can sing. I was like, well, I can hold a tune. So tick. And it was like, and we want someone who is either blind or visually impaired. And it sort of made me sit back and go, wow, like, because I'd never seen, you know, a casting that was like, we want that. This thing for years that I thought was like a curse on like my acting career um, Mm -hmm. was now like, yeah, but that's that's what we want. And sure enough, I I walked in and I explained myself and they offered me the part and um, we were rehearsing it and unfortunately we were on our second day of tech week and then good old bojo made that announcement of um yes um, theaters you should um uh, probably not not go you know we're not locking down yet but you shouldn't go to you know it was that weird week where it was like we're not in lockdown but don't do anything basically yeah. um it was that so the producers sadly came in and were like we're two days away from opening night but we've we've got to stop 
So unfortunately, oh, it hasn't happened. There are plans to get it going again once that, things are a bit more open. I but... really hope so. I really, really hope so because that sounds lovely and it's it's great to get as well like a a, a story that isn't that well known about about someone like that at, yeah. you know out in the open um so yeah i i do hope you get the chance to to do fingers it fingers crossed man fingers and, crossed you know i'm definitely gonna come and watch oh I'm bless saying. you man <laughs> I'd, <laughs> love be ace. That. I'd love that <laughs> that'd be um, ace covid permitting of covid course. permitting of course god yeah. i hate those words i'm yeah. so done with those words um well we're going to take a very short break there mm-hmm. and when we come back we it's feature time it's yeah. feature time and we're gonna have a little look over at the dvd shelf and see what you would like to put in the dvd collection awesome Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a lovely break. I am still Adam Martin, and with me is Josh Carr. <laughs> that just really... My head was like, wait, what? I, I was like, I I'm Adam up. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to AMTV Radio. <laughs> just put the no. theme in the start after the break. It's yeah, I like... will do. I will. Um, no, of course, I'm Josh yes. Carr, and with me yes, is Adam he is. Martin. That's me. And... We are going to go right on over <laughs> to that trusty, faithful old shelf. It's buckling under the weight of the amount of episodes we've got now. Book positively buckling, but I think we can add another one on there yeah. before the buckaroo sets <laughs> off. I don't know. What, every, these are getting weirder every week. Um, <laughs> let's go to the DVD collection. Power of Greyskull. The Unicorn and the Wasp or Love of Monsters? Which one do you think I prefer? No, I mean, which one do you want to watch first? You are pulling my leg. So, Adam, Mr. Martin. That's me. <laughs> that is you. That is you. What would you like to submit to the DVD collection? See, this is something, as soon as you asked me if I wanted to come on, this was something I was... It's weird, isn't it? You think you'd have like the one shining thing that would like instantly pop in your head. But I had like 10 different things pop in my head and I was like, oh God, I can only pick one. Um, I'll do so, I'll do one or two honourable mentions. Um, part of me thought for the meme, because I, I think we've mentioned I'm for some reason now known as the, the twin dilemma stan, which is not, <laughs> I'd argue is not technically true. I just think it's not as bad as everyone else seems to think it is. I yeah. was tempted. I was like, "Do I do I put the twin?" But then there was like, "There's other options that I thought I can't feasibly choose the twin dilemma <laughs> over those." So you know, respect to the twin dilemma, but that has to that has to sit aside for now. Mm-hmm. Um, the other honourable mention I was going to say was the Happiness Patrol because I think that is a great three part McCoy story. It's one of those weird ones. Do you think that like, do you remember like when when Doctor Who came back? And for some reason, I remember this, like when I got into classic who the McCoy era was like weirdly hated by like the mainly like, you know, the older fans who'd like been with it. the Yeah. First time around. It well, was like, I've, like, I've, I've, I've only watched it recently, but yeah. I, I do remember growing up. It had a bad reputation. Yeah. People Strange, would like look because... at it and go like, Oh, the, these are the three years that like Doctor Who like went down and died and not, not even just season 24, which is arguably the, I think the weakest of the three people were like, no, it's all of it. Do you know what I mean? It was like everything. In yeah. It, so. I completely disagree. I mean, 24, I, like I said, I can, I can sort of see that 25 and 26 though. They are, they are some of the best Doctor Who we've ever had. Oh, That's... absolutely. That's top tier, and the Happiness Patrol is, is so it, good. Is, is so so good. So so, so good. good. Uh, anyone listening, if you haven't seen it in like a while, or if you haven't seen it at all, please don't let any bad hype or whatever. Like, just give it, give it a watch. Because I remember for me growing up, you know, see, it, it's the Candy Man, isn't it? That's the thing you always see first, and everyone's yeah. like, "Oh, look, it's the Bertie Bassett Man," and 
and I admit, as a kid, I think that hype, you know, did affect me a bit. I was like, oh, this must be like a really bad one then, you know, with what everyone's saying. And then when I watched mm-hmm. it for the first time some years later, I was like, what's everyone talking about? This is actually really good. <laughs> so, yeah, that's honorable mention. But the the story I am going to choose is one, it was one of my, well, <laughs> build the tension. Uh, it's classic Who. It's not new Who. Ooh. I know, I know. Ooh. And this is one of my wasn't my first but it's one of my first classic who stories that i watched um i loved it then i've seen it it's I, i'd probably say it's the classic who story i've watched the most like on repeat um mm-hmm. and it's ironically the one before the happiness patrol i'm choosing remembrance of the daleks oh i know that, i know that's, that is a big one. <laughs> that's a lovely pick i'm, I'm glad surprised no one had picked it sooner before you sent me like Oh, here's what you can't choose. I was like, surely someone's, surely someone's picked. Yeah, I thought now. it would have been picked by now. Yeah, um, it's one of the big ones, isn't it? We, you know, it's 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 obviously one of the big ones. Yeah. Um, I mean, fantastic timing on your part because, of course, next week on Who Knew, I have Sophie Aldridge joining yeah. me. <laughs> yes, you do. And yeah. we will 100 percent be discussing this story in in detail. Of course, but, yeah. But, what draws you to I mean, it's hard to say because it's so obvious what draws you to it. Yeah. It's, it's just really, really fucking good. It is. Um, it is. I, I, but I yeah. Mean, I think Go it's, ahead. I mean, I got it when I was, I want to say 10. So I'd only just, you know, we'd had series one of New Who. And then yeah. in the gap between that and series two, I really wanted to watch as much classic Who as possible. But of course, people might, some people might not remember back then, some of us do, but like back in 2005, DVDs were very expensive still. Like they mm. were very, not like now where you can get like a classic Who for like five quid from HMV. But like back in the day, like classic Who, I think I got one for Christmas as a Christmas present. Um, and then I bought Remembrance with my own hard earned pocket money. Uh, it was the bare bones DVD from like 2001. So hard, no, like no making of mm-hmm. hardly any special features, not the best quality. I bought that for like 11 pounds 99, which for a 10 year old is a lot of money. You know, that's a good, like mm-hmm. four or five weeks pocket money saved up. Um, and I think I chose it because I mean, Wolf want Daleks. I mean, any kid, I was like, yeah, Daleks, that's probably a good place to, to start. And, um, I, I was always intrigued by McCoy's doctor. I'd only read about him at this point, you know, in, in books and stuff. And they all said, despite his like, you know, small appearance or comical appearance, he was like a master manipulator had, you know, had this dark edge to him. And I was like, Oh, that's quite, that's quite a contrast. That sounds interesting. And yeah, remembrance, I guess is really the start of that. Cause like I said, season 24, you don't really get that master manipulator thing. It's really no. with, with this story. I mean, I, and I just loved it. The whole like the hand of Omega thing, the way the doctor sort of knew what was going on, but he wasn't going to tell you what was going on. And I mean, I love the white and gold dark, like that design is beautiful. It's just yes. so, I, so good. I have, I have the character options toy right in front of me. Yeah. Li- the one... Literally bearing down on me as yeah, we speak. Just there right it is. here. And <laughs> yeah, it looks I, I, beautiful. I've got one out of our, zoom shot well actually j- just for you josh sorry audio listeners i'm, I'm yeah no this isn't this isn't the best for, <laughs> for you guys at home um i do apologize yeah, okay. i adam adam's just uh, going to ooh. grab a dalek well and we're gonna see. play with our toys we'll play with our toys i've got this big boy oh um, my lord so this for the um, listeners yeah <laughs> this is massive so this came out um I think, well, I think it technically came out a bit before New Who, but only by like a year or so. And then Doctor Who magazine, you know, when New Who came back, promoted the shit out of like any classic toy possible. And so when I saw Remembrance and then I saw this, like a remote control, I was like, yo, Christmas 2006, top of the list. And yeah, got this. He doesn't work anymore, sadly. Uh, Well, he probably does if I cleaned out the... The batteries but you know who i ain't got time for that but he's he's a nice display piece i have in the you know he's a nice yeah. he's a nice thing he looks down on me from on he's high beautiful. but uh, he's he beautiful. is beautiful does he yeah. have a name uh, i call him derek derek the dalek derek yeah. the dalek derek the dalek i'm just gonna oh. have to plonk him in now but um yeah but um re- i mean the color scheme of remembrance and that whole dalek civil war thing as well like that's a really intriguing concept i think that i guess we sort of saw a bit in revolution of the daleks of course this new year that sort of idea of purity and um 
imbalance and stuff. And um, genuinely, the first, the cliffhanger to part one sent chills down my spine as a kid, which is I d- just like the whole framing of it, the Dalek coming up the stairs, the doctor pinned against the door, yeah. aces knocked out for only 10 seconds, it seems. But, you know, forget that. At the t- first time watching, it's a really good cliffhanger. And I can't imagine what that must have been like in... 1988 because obviously that was the first time Daleks went upstairs and of course first time they wouldn't have known that Ace just gets up in part two do you know what I mean it's a really yeah. good because you do think how the hell is he going to get out of that one like it's I think that's the best Doctor Who cliffhanger on on first because it's really on first watch isn't it because cliffhangers you could argue sort yeah. of lose the big thing on repeats because you know what's coming but I think exactly, on first yeah. watch if a cliffhanger genuinely makes you go how are they going to get out of that one? Then it's done its job. Let's face it, some classic who cliffhangers, you're like, uh, they're not really, you sort of think yeah. that's I mean, bit. especially around this era, it's a lot of zooming on faces. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, A lot of it, surprised expressions and all that. But, is, um, yeah, is. but this one was like, I was like, yeah, this is this is good. And um, yeah, it's just, I mean, I w- as you say, you'll probably chat about it with Sophie more in depth, but it is just, it's a really solid Seventh Doctor story. And I think, it's weird because some some people say, oh, it's not a good jumping on point for new people because there's so much, like, you know, there's a lot of callbacks, you know, the whole, the doctor, it's implied the doctor left the hand of Omega in his like first incarnation. And you've got references yeah. to like Zygons and Yeti. And obviously the, there's the Daleks and Davros, but I don't know. Cause when I watched Remembrance, I think at that point I hadn't seen like, you know, an unearthly child. I hadn't seen Terror of the Zygons or, you know, any form of the web of, do you know what I mean? I hadn't, I hadn't been exposed to that law, but I still found yeah. it very enjoyable and I understood it. So I'd argue it is a good jumping on point to a degree. I think so, definitely. Yeah. 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 And I think as well, it, it's it's one of those stories we, we talk on, you know, people on Twitter talk all the time that there are some stories that have aged terribly. Um, <laughs> you know. We look, I mean, even very, very badly, you know, yes. things like Talons of Wang Chiang. Oh, dear, yes. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not good. But this is a story that has aged so well, hmm. I'd argue that it's maybe even more relevant today than it was then. You know, Absolutely. You've, you've got that whole scene of, of Ace, you know, looking looking through the window and she sees the sign and yeah. you know obviously a lot of links to segregation and a lot of parallels with the Daleks having their own civil war and it's just and I know Sylvester's spoken about this in a few interviews that they were very conscious of of what they were doing but yeah. like I said I, I don't think a classic who story is aged better than than remembrance absolutely and it's, which is I sad mean, which is sad because you would okay. hope that that we'd have come further than it it's still being relevant today um absolutely you know after it was made 30 odd years ago but yeah and i mean not. there's the whole line I, I think it's mike says it mike smith where he's trying to justify himself to ace and he's like i believe the quote is you've got to protect your own keep the outsiders out so your own people have a chance and i and i just think now i'm like that is not on everyone who voted for it, but I was like, that's Brexit, you know, for some, yeah. for some people, that is the, that is that whole mantra, you know, I, again, I'm not saying everyone, but I think we can agree. Some people might have voted for it purely for, Oh, keep Johnny foreigner out, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you're right. It is. So it is such a shame that it, the fact it has aged so well ties into the fact that the problems it addresses then are still relevant now. But yeah, as a an example of like basically the human race is messed up and we need to do a lot better. It's like yeah, it's it's a standout yeah. story. Nails it. it. It nails it. And um and obviously as I said, you know, Sophie's on the show next week. I have no doubts that we will be talking about the baseball bat and you know who are you oh, calling God, the small? baseball bat? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Just so many great moments, and I I love the like you mentioned the callbacks. Yeah, I think they're some of the the coolest callbacks. Like I love, even though it's not the same book. Mm. I know there's a lot of criticism around that, but when Ace picks up the book yes. that Susan holds in in an yeah. unearthly child, is it, is it the French Revolution book on the French Revolution? I think it is. Yeah, yeah. 
I can't remember now. Um, no, it's such a sweet, like little, little. But again, I'd yeah, you'd I'd argue for those who know, it's like ah. Oh, but for those who don't, maybe it's like oh, she's found a book on the French Revolution. Like yeah, yeah. I'd argue it's it works. The only thing about Remembrance that makes me chuckle, and <laughs> it's like when the renegade Daleks are leaving their little bait, the, the little wobble, the little wobbly Dalek. We, I like, we you know. spoke about this last week with with, with Ellie, with, yeah. with Tardis Monkey. I, I love it. it, it love makes me smile. But they couldn't, I'm like, you couldn't have found a, a bet, like, did you need to shoot them on, like, cobbled ground, just going, going like this yeah. all the time? Because You've not got a little carpet you can lay down. Just because to... there are so many moments in this story, I would argue, where the Daleks are threatening again. Like again, like mm-hmm. uh, the Dalek chasing the Doctor up the stairs, um, the special weapons Dalek. I love that scene where it just blows off the gates of Rack. Like that is like whoa, okay, like that's that's terrifying. Yeah, like there's there's so many moments, and then and then you just think, oh, it's just, it's dampened ever so slightly by the fact these boys have a little bit of a little bit of a I wobble think, i but, think uh, i did i think i completely disagree i oh, think that's... <laughs> I, I adore the wobble so much i think new who daleks need to wobble more. need to wobble more <laughs> put them on yeah. cobbled, cobbled streets oh god could you imagine <laughs> get them wobbling. um well what a pick what Thanks, a pick man. um yeah. you know it's 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 the unofficial 25th anniversary yeah i'm i'm gonna say this now Please don't hate on me, you know, on Twitter or anything, but <laughs> fuck Silver Nemesis. <laughs> this, this is the 25th That's, anniversary special. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, is I, the official podcast agree. statement <laughs> on the 25th anniversary. <laughs> it's Remembrance, yeah. it's not Silver it's Nemesis. It's Remembrance, yeah. <laughs> it's not Silver Nemesis. Oh, bless. Uh, and am, I, am I right in thinking, is this the first Sylvester McC- Koi story in the it uh, is. in the DVD it is collection. The first Sylvester Justice, McCoy story. justice. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, there's a there's a couple who are still waiting. There's a, there's a there's a few now who's still waiting. Jody hasn't got a story in yet. Mm-hmm. Probably understandable because I think you know a lot of people base this off nostalgia. They're quite sure, new. sure, yeah. Um, Colin, oh bless oh, Colin, poor Colin, and Pat. Oh, that surprised Pat, me. Really? Oh, Pat doesn't have okay. a story in yet. Yeah. That's interesting. I, mean, I thought, I mean, again, I think I, I mentioned this last week, but, you know, Christopher Eccleston supremacy. Because, oh, man. Yeah. You know, it, we're, we're, we're about to hit episode 20 next week. And yeah. He's already got six episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's how many of us started, though, isn't it? So, it, like I say, it, it is that nostalgia, like, feeding yeah. in. and all, but, all three of his two-parters. Um, yeah, I that's... will say, I will say for poor Colin, one of the story, not including the twin dilemma, uh, one story <laughs> I genuinely did consider was Revelation of the Daleks because I do hold a love, I do hold a lot of love for that story. But when it, I came down to it, I was like, I think I'd I'd have to pick Remembrance above Revelation just by a little bit. But I do love yeah. Revelation, so that would have been a if someone had already chosen Remembrance, I could have well chosen Revolution. Revelation. Yeah. Oh, there's too many R's. Too oh. many R's of the Daleks. There's too there's too many. <laughs> Stop it, uh, writers. Think of something else. <laughs> well, that, that was the DVD collection. And it's yeah. it's on to on to the next as we go on over to everyone's favorite little bird website for bloody Twitter. For God's sake! Twitter. Thank oh. you, David Tennant. Thank you, David. Seeing us in there, um, <laughs> we've got loads of questions. Oh man, <laughs> I get... haven't. I tried not. They kept popping up. I had to mute the conversation because I didn't oh, want to read anything. That's good. That's yeah. good. I like that. I wanted it do... to be as fresh as possible. <laughs> we do get. We do get people sometimes here. Like, yeah, I had a read. I had a read through the questions, and I'm like, well, that's great. It's yeah. good that you're preparing, but I, I like the fact that you've come in. Are completely unknowing because yeah. as you probably know my audience are a bit fucked so is mine so in, the nice, it's fine. in the nicest <laughs> way possible guys you ask some weird questions you're all mental so you're all nutters. <laughs> um we've got some great questions though cool, um cool, cool. so i'm gonna rattle through a few there's mm-hmm. going to be a few that we may need to spend more time on. Sure. But because there's so many, I'm sorry if we don't get through all of them. Um, yeah. Again, probably one of the ones where 
that sometimes I just get like bombarded with questions in uh, yeah. such a short span of time. Yeah. Like we only announced this last night <laughs> and I've got like 30, oh, like geez. 40 <laughs> questions. I'll, um, I'll try and be as concise as possible. Where, where yeah. So. Well, first of all, uh, long time listener and friend of the show, Jamie, Jamie underscore season seven. Jamie has asked two questions for Adam. Okay, okay. Will you clear us for re-entry? Yes, absolutely. And how many beans make five? Three. Wonderful. <laughs> Cal. <laughs> Cal at generic underscore tweeting. Very, very dear friend of this podcast. And also, just because I haven't mentioned it so far, I also want to give him a massive shout out. Cal got me the season. Uh, the series six steel book oh um because i couldn't find it anywhere and he he got it for me oh and cal. sent it to me cal is an absolute angel and cal if you find the peter cushing films on steel book yet yeah, just dm me and we'll talk <laughs> okay yeah me too cal <laughs> cal's now going to turn into everyone's steel book dealer yeah. please don't do that please don't bombard cal <laughs> This was a one-off, guys. Yeah, Cal yeah, doesn't own all of these Maybe. steel books yeah. in a warehouse. <laughs> um, you know, he's not a scalper. No. Leave him be. Um, he's asked... See, I said there was loads of questions, but because, you know, I love Cal. Cal gets three. Okay. Um, which doctor had the best hair? Oh, uh, I'm going to be deadly specific and say uh, Peter Capaldi in Twice Upon a Time only. Cracking, yeah, great, great. His main is on point on in that. Like. Yeah, absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Um, what is the most episodes you've watched in a day? In a day, uh, I think it would have to be. I've got twenty-seven. Uh, I it was a. Oh my lord! It was. <laughs> I think it was twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Two. 20. Is that even humanly possible? I think it was it was a mixture of New Who and Classic Who, was it? No, hang on. It was it was before the pandemic, like January uh, 2020. I was going through a bit of a low patch, lol. So what do we all do when we're sad? We watch Doctor Who. I think literally from the moment I woke, I woke up really early. It was like half seven or something. And I just started watching Rose. And then I think by like nearly midnight, I... I want to say I nearly finished season two, hence why I said 27, but I could be wrong. Let's say around the 20 range. Let's go with that. It was, that I was definitely insane. on, I was definitely on series two because all I did was just keep playing next whilst eating prawn cocktail Pringles and drinking my weight in beer. So, <laughs> well, well, there you go. There you go. Um, and which Doctor Who novel would you say is your favorite? Ooh, ooh. Oh, okay. Um, Ooh, well, I've read. I, I know it's very spicy. Uh, I've read uh, many of the target ones, and um, I must say, uh, this is where I can give it a chance to strike the twin dilemma. Uh, <laughs> honestly, though, the target book I feel does a better job of getting across like what a failed regeneration is supposed to be, if that makes sense, than it did mm. on screen. Because I feel that's the great shame. You know, everyone's like, oh, it's the one where he strangles Perry and they don't talk about anything else when th there's so much more to it. And I feel Eric, I th yeah, Eric Saywood uh, wrote the novelization. I just feel he gives it more justice. Like, really? It, you know, it's what should have happened on the telly. So, yeah, I'll go, I'll go the twin dilemma in this one. Yeah. Nice yeah. pick. It's one because I'm, I'm very new to the Target novels. Mm. Um, I've only read a couple. Um, but I really want to dip into some episodes that I don't like, just because, <laughs> yeah. from what I've heard, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a like a redemption point for a lot of episodes. Like one that I really want to try is the Crimson Horror. Oh yes, I I I, do I not, don't do not like that one. I no. do not like the Crimson oh, Horror. Oh dear. <laughs> I, I mean, we're we're talking potential potential least favorite oh, episode ooh, of ooh. all time oh wow um, i i i've not seen it for good reason i've watched okay. it once okay um and i i remember despising it wow potential least favorite Damn. yeah i'm gonna 
because I've got the I've got the series seven still book, I'm uh-huh. gonna be watching it for the for the second time quite soon. So I mean please don't cancel me. It's, no. <laughs> I'm I'm actually I'm I really hope that I don't hate it. I wanna yeah. I, I hate hating at Doctor Who episodes. It's my least yeah. favorite thing. I, I want to love the same. every episode. So I want to give it another go. Yeah. Hopefully I I'll feel, find something I enjoy. And I hopefully that. when I get the target, I'll enjoy that as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. So yeah. Sorry about that tangent. Um, That's all right. Oscar Grouchos, Oscar another good Grouchos. friend of the, another good friend of the pod, has said, uh, I'm going to leave this one to you. Um, what makes a truly engrossing Doctor Who podcast? Oh, come on. <laughs> um, well, no, I think... Well, yours I've... isn't technically a Doctor Who podcast. No, is... I like to... I like to. Like, I guess like my channel, I like to keep things very open because I, I never want to like... I think I think if you, you know, when you brand it as a Doctor Who podcast, I think that's great. You know, if that's what you want to do, I, I just think... Mm. I, I just want to keep my options open, I guess. But um, I think... Well, yeah, just like I think being very cool and natural, like like you're a very natural dude. Like it oh, doesn't. No, no listen, it. listen, 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 listen. No, I think Adam. no, no, no. Some podcasters do a thing, not just Doctor Who ones. Some podcasters do a thing where I've heard them. They have guests on, and obviously you could argue all chats with guests are interviews in a way. But I mean, I've heard somewhere it's like straight interview. You know, it's like here is a question, here is an answer, here is it. Do you know what I mean? Very like by very linear by the numbers. I love Doctor Who podcasts in particular, where like we what, like what we've done today. We go off on tangents. We explore things. We talk about memories that pop in our heads. I, I love it. I just love people expressing their love for this show, especially in those unplanned moments. Like mm. I, I think the more loose you are, that sounds awful. Fuck. Um, <laughs> it's fine. That's me cancelled. Uh, so, oh, no. The more loose you are, Martin. Twenty twenty one. Um, no, I just I. I guess what I mean, the more like chill you are about it, you know, the more you're willing to like let the conversation go where it goes, which is something I try to do and what we've done here. Like, I honestly think that is probably the core thing, I would say. Just keep mm-hmm. it, keep it cool, keep it chill. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I mean, me and Molly Marsh talked about this. Um, obviously, this is the the the, the, the trifecta of of Doctor Who podcasts yeah. that are sort of intertwining <laughs> slightly. And I'm expecting Molly Marsh to pop up on a screen and call us a dandy and a clown. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, we, we were talking about how there's sort of, we, we've sort of found that there's two types of, of podcasts that we both do, where you have podcasts like this, where we get to chat. And sometimes you do, sort of have to tailor it to more of an interview style. Sure. But sure. even then, I still try and so so for example, Katie Manning. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to go in like this because, you know, me and Katie Manning aren't going to chat about the twin dilemma for 10 minutes. <laughs> but yeah. so like I did have a few pre-planned questions. Yeah, but no, I've, of course. But I, I, I never go into a podcast with more than like a one page of notes on my yeah. phone. And I'm the like, same. I, I think I'll, I'll clarify. Like, if if you're if anyone doing a Doctor Who podcast, if it is like that more straight interview style, that's cool. Like, I'm not knocking it. I just yeah, think, yeah, like, yeah, even yeah. even like you said, even when you're doing that, as long as you keep it very cool and very like just chilled out. I don't know. I just think that's the key. Like, because podcasts are really a place where people just come and chat. You know. And yeah. I never want a chat to feel like, I don't know, like, I don't know what the word is. Like I'm grilling you. As, well, yeah, yeah, in a way, I suppose. But um, yeah, yeah, just chill out, chill, guys. Keep it chill. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, similarly deep question. Uh, what is your favourite incarnation of the Master that isn't Gordon Tipple? <laughs> oh, but he was my favourite. No, I'm joking. Oh, of course uh, it's Gordon. Respect to Gordon Tipple um for standing around for three minutes uh or however long it was um for a long time it was anthony ainley but that was only because this was pre when john singh came in so for like those 2005 six my classic who knowledge all i'd seen was the ainley master so he was mm. the only one i could really and i think he's great anyway uh now having seen all of them i'm probably gonna say um i'm probably gonna go the og roger delgado you know I just think there's yeah. 
He takes what I is essentially Delgado. like a pantomime villain, but he makes it work. Like, because the master so in those menacing. stories, well, yeah, he's, he's so really menacing, menacing, but also very charming, which is uh, great, you know. And so, yeah. Also, like, it, it makes me want to see him in more stuff. And it, it makes me wish that we'd got, like, I, I love seeing Doctor Who actors that are, like, paired, like, become, like, really nice working pairings. Yeah. So, like, for example, Catherine Tate and David Tennant. Oh, yeah. Just whatever you put them in, they work. And I think that would have been the case for John Pertwee and Roger Delgado. I just think Absolutely. them too. So I, I, I always, I've always had this idea, like, imagine if we got a John Pertwee and Roger Delgado sitcom. Oh, God. That would have been brilliant. Because Roger oh, Delgado God. in Frontier in Space is <laughs> utterly hilarious. It, it's he that is, line he has about the Daleks where he's like mocking, he like, like mimics their voice, then he goes like, oh, you stupid tin boxes. And it's yeah. brilliant. And also when he um, when he's shouting at the Ogron, <laughs> I was like, that is comedy gold. It's one yeah. of the funniest, you know, it's one of the funniest Doctor Who episodes. I don't Absolutely. even know if it's intentional, but it's <laughs> so funny. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I love Delgado too. Yeah. Um always got up. a soft spot for Sim. Yeah. Because he was my first mm-hmm. master and yeah. Well, I always well, he was I your first master, was he? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, so... Damn. <laughs> damn. Um, yeah. No, I think all the others are great. I don't think there's a master I don't like, but Del yeah, Delgado pips it for me, I think. Yeah. I mean, even when people lean into the pantomime, not not yeah. mentioning names, Eric. <laughs> uh, yeah, I always like to dress for the dress. <laughs> he didn't say it in the new Big Finish box set. He didn't say it, and I was didn't very. Dis- I was. I mean, I guess they probably felt we c- we can't pander to the fans this much. You know what I mean? Like, um. But yeah, a, a, a quick tangent. I will say, give him a se- listen to that box set. It's really good. Um, I think they get the interpretation of his master spot on. In that yeah. he is a devilish figure who revels in being fucking evil, and it's yeah. great. Like it's so good. Yeah, I I like the sound of it. I really I, I want to see a bit more of the the Roberts Master. I, yeah. I, I, I haven't really delved into the Master on Big Finish much yet, other than Master, um, mm. the McCoy and oh yeah 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 uh, the, the yeah. Joe Lister episode, which is oh so I mean, good incredible so probably the best i've listened to so far but mm. um sam at cyber planner one hey the boy he oh funnily enough talking about the master he's asked a question <laughs> this is a great question i love this yeah that naughty boy the master <laughs> has opened up your head right and is inserting a gizmo into your brain okay that gizmo replaces your conscious with an AI that simulates a villain from the Doctor Who universe. Okay. (laughs) Who do you pick? Oh, Remember that every thought in your head will sound like that character. So your your internal monologue will be that, that monster. That Sam, that is a very in-depth, good question. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That that naughty boy, the master, the very <laughs> naughty boy. Um, he's not the master. He's, he's a, a very, very naughty, naughty boy. boy. That is a. Uh, oh, I'm a doing like a. I'm doing like a rough like run through in my head of like every villain ever. Um, I th- well. Part of me wants to say uh, the 80s cyber leader just because having David Banks's voice in my head would oh, be fucking be gorgeous. Um, but then I think Cybermen wouldn't really have much many other like thoughts because obviously they're very like, well, it's like, you know, the, the logical thing, isn't it? So they'd, be, that, they'd actually, I think, be quite boring thoughts, really. Um, yeah. Is it my thought? Like, I can still have like my thoughts or does it have to be like, it's the villain's thoughts? Adam, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't really know. <laughs> I don't if, it, really if it was know. if it was still with my thoughts, I'd go 80s cyber leader. If it was with the villain's thoughts, 
I would fuck it. I'm giving it to the candy man. Oh no! Nice. I, I like licorice all sorts, man. And I, well, I like sweets. I'm not gonna lie. So um, yeah, just thinking about making sweets would be fucking heaven. So yeah, let's yeah. do it. Let's um, go I've just realised that I'm also answering all of these questions. Oh, um, what, what these would you weren't, do then? These weren't ans- asked to me. I always do this. I'm sorry, but I, right. I'm a sucker for a Doctor Who question. Um, I have two answers um, that I can't pick between. Oh. I mean, it's got to be Briggsy in some form. <laughs> so I'm going Dalek Khan. Oh. Insane Dalek Khan. Uh, of course, of course. Or, no, no, yeah, I've changed my mind. My favourite voice in all of Doctor Who, which is the Dalek Emperor from Bad Wolf Ooh, Final Ways. Oh, that deep, booming voice. Hell yeah. Just also like uh, my my internal monologue which is usually like um i need to sneeze oh i want some cocoa pops <laughs> um i what doctor Who episode am i going to watch today Hell that's yeah. my internal monologue or just like the the monkey with the symbols <laughs> <Simba, yeah>. um <laughs> oh man so yeah just hearing that in the dalek emperor's voice would be great um awesome. dalekium hey what's up here Friend of the show. Um, everyone's a friend of the show. Yeah. I, 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 you're, all, just, you're all friends here. It's all... Literally, everyone who's here is a friend of the show. I've just labelled <laughs> everybody. Um, the, so on brand. I always oh. call him. on Peter on brand, Miles. Hell yeah. Has asked, what's your favourite Doctor Who theme tune? Ah, okay. Uh, favourite Doctor Who theme tune? It's the Sylvester McCoy one. And Ooh, I don't give a shit what people say. Before. Not had it is, that. It is a fucking banger, my dude. I, You're the, a sucker I, for eighties as well, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, but I, I, mean, I know that I know that's the main complaint that it it sounds too of its time. And yeah, I mean the the synths, the I mean the fact that it's like ninety percent synth. Um, but I mean, yeah, I I I grew up on eighties music because that was what my parents had a lot of, and I think hearing something like that that sounded a lot like my childhood i was like hell yeah let's do it and it's just i think it's it, i don't know it provokes like fun it provokes mystery there's certain mm. points in the song that still send like a little shiver down my spine like just the way the synths are arranged i just it's it's great it's a banger it's a great theme yeah it's a great great theme um is your hair so big because it's full of all the secrets <laughs> Full of all the secrets. Ah, well, I mean, because it's full of secrets. I'm like, I'm like, you know, Marge in that episode of The Simpsons where she'll just like pull thing, like any random thing from inside. You her have hair. got magnificent hair. Thank you so much. I mean, you, viewers, I, it's not on point right now. No, I me, have uh, never seen your hair look bad. Oh, bless you, man. I've seen I... your hair in many different forms because <laughs> your your hair looks different every time I see you. Yeah. Like on like I see you post a picture on Twitter. Yeah. And it always I'm... looks magnificent. Thank you. I just you, want man. to say that. I mean, blame lockdown for that at not having had a haircut. Uh, in my... I'm drowning but, um, in my own hair. Honestly, like... man. It's a uh, yeah. I had one t- well, I had it today actually when we're recording a haircut, and it's still because it's been so long, I don't I now think I haven't had enough cut off because I tried sticking it all up again and it's still like falling flat. But again, like it's oh, been six no. months. So when he was cutting it, I was like, shit, I can't, you know, I can't remember. And I don't want him to cut off too much, you know, straight away. So I feel like I'm going to have yeah. to, I'm going to have to go back. Uh, back, um, back street may be around for a little while longer. As I say, so. Oh, nice. So. <laughs> nice. As we're recording this, it's the 13th of April. It is. Um, we're recording this quite far in advance. Mm. I'm not getting mine cut to the 30th. Oh, oh God. I am, I am yeah. not in a good place hair wise. Hey. Um, but in answer to your question, Peter, yes, my hair is full of secrets. And if you want them, you're going to have to come and get them. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> um, and if you could be any character in Doctor Who, who would you want to play? I mean, it's cliche. I mean, wouldn't we all love to have a go at the Doctor? Let's be real. We'd all love to have a, a good spin on it. But I'd, I'd lo- also love being a companion. Uh, like, I mean, traveling the TARDIS, fuck yeah. Like, I don't care what I'm doing. But also, I thought recently, I'd love to have a go at being a villain. Like, and it's true, I have to say, like, being the villain is definitely, like, the most fun part, especially if it's written 
you know, if they're like traditionally evil, like, you know, like evil laughs and like really evil plans, yeah, like really con- campy conquer villain. the universe. But I'd, I'd love to do something like that and just treat it seriously, of course, but I'd love to just like get my teeth into something like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, Malaka Luke. Ooh. Um, Luca B. Luca B. Yes. Hi, Luca. Yeah. Uh, hi, Josh and Adam. Hi. Hi. Not many people say hi on these <laughs> questions. Everyone's just like, who's the question? <laughs> people, I want you to say hi more. Yeah, I'm here, hello. you know. Yeah. I'm a human being. <laughs> and I have feelings. Um, so I have two questions for Adam. Okay. One. I discovered you through your Doctor Who ratings slash viewing figures series. Ah. So I wanted to ask you what made you start doing it and how is the mm-hmm. process of finding the information for that series done? This is right, something yeah. I want to know as, as well, because <laughs> surely that's tough information to get hold of. Well, it it was for a long time because um, I've always been, I've always had a thing for numbers. Like, you know, as a kid, I was one of those kids who like wanted to learn their times tables to like, you know, however high a number yeah. they could go. I don't know what it is. I just, I just like numbers, I guess. So when I got yeah. into Doctor Who and some early reference books I had talked about the viewing figures and I was like, oh, numbers. So like it tracks how many people watch. I think I've always had a fascination with it. And I think I'd say, honestly, for the last two, three years, I'd wanted to start this series but I never did, partly because at that, that time with where I was at with my channel, I didn't think people would want Doctor Who stuff. And also the information wasn't reliable back then. Like, you know, there's stuff online, but I often found that be people saying stuff, but I could never back it up. You know, there was never like a secondary, maybe for a few yeah. stories, but not for everything. It was different everywhere you looked. So I thought, oh, well, I want to be accurate. But then I can see them on my shelf. There's a book series called Doctor Who, The Complete History which has 90 volumes and was like released every fortnight from like 2015 to 19, I think. Um, And it chronicles the making of every Doctor Who story ever made. And uh, there's a section of each story where it tells you about the publicity it got, about the competition it faced over on ITV and other channels and the viewing figures that it got. And I thought, well, this is being made by, you know, like Doctor Who magazine writers, people with access to the BBC. It was licensed by the BBC. So you know, I thought if if any information is going to be correct, this is the place where. Yeah. And so really the series is pretty much spawned from from those books. If those books never came out, the viewing figure series probably wouldn't be a thing unless more reliable sources were available. So I really do owe it all to those books, really. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's cool. That's cool, though. It's, it's a really, really interesting series. Thank you, man. Um, because, I mean, I, I assume... Is your plan you're going to do everything? I'm going to do everything. So, some people oddly think they leave comments saying, Oh, so you're going to stop after uh, Sylvester McCoy? I was like, No, <laughs> I'm going to do, I'm going to do everything. Well, yeah, I mean, oddly enough, the book series stops just because when they were made, the last one they covered is Twice Upon a Time. And yeah. there's, you know, there's been no talk of them restarting it. Well, not yet anyway, for like Jodie's era or anything. But I feel the more modern who you get, the more the sources are reliable. I feel that was yeah. where I had trouble before. Like classic who sources for viewing figures were a bit more sketchy, but new who, like there's so much more uh, resources. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'll do everything. And I'm not worried when I get to Jodie's eventually. I actually planned it out. If I manage to keep doing it every two weeks, I will get to series 13, assuming it'll be out by April of 2022. So we've got a, I've got a year left on this thing. Wow. So uh, that's if I keep to schedule. But um, yeah, we'll see. It's good. Yeah, man. Well, it's it's, it's exciting. It's a, it's a really, really cool series. Thanks, man. You've got some great series on your channel. Love them. Um, Luca's second question. Mm. So even though I know Eleven's era isn't necessarily your favourite, yes. and that you really <laughs> like the story I'm about to mention, we can at least agree that the eleventh hour is at least slightly better than the twin dilemma. Guys, look, I like the twin. I'm I'm not like the B. <laughs> Everyone thinks I've been called a twin dilemma. Stan, uh, people tell me it's my favorite episode of all time. It's not. I just I I like it. Okay. Um, but yeah, is the eleventh hour better than twin dilemma? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> like yeah, that. The Matt Smith era is a weird one because 
I mean, what he's referring to is like I that aired, like we're saying, tricky teen years, we'll call it, you know, between like 14 and 17 when that was on for me. And it's I always watched it. I never stopped. But for whatever reason, the, the shift to the more like fairy tale whimsy stuff just didn't click with me at that point in time. And I yeah. think still that affects me a little bit. I'm all for I'm all for whimsy. Doctor Who is great when it does whimsy. But yeah, there's just there's just something about that era that I can't put my finger on that. It just the vast majority of the stories just don't ring with me at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I. I feel not probably. Yeah, I don't I don't despise it or anything. No, like, there's there's not many stories that I hate in that era. Crimson horror. <laughs> yeah, <that's one>. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I ju- I just don't vibe with it as yeah, I don't vibe yeah. with it as well. Yeah. Um I I have this this theory that every single Moffat story has at least one absolutely cringe-worthy moment. Oh, don't. You usually even see- if it's one second, it's yeah. the, the, every single story has it. <laughs> Do you think he sat there and he was like, insert browser history joke oh, here? God. <laughs> it was only funny the thing. first time in it the really 11th was. hour. It was only funny then and then no, yeah. no other time. It was. It yeah. was. Let's not even get on to a, oh, God. a skirt. No. No, oh, no. Oh, oh, no, no, no. no, no I'm no. going to be sick. Um, <laughs> Jamie Bevan. Jamie Bevan. Jerry the Ferry one. What's up, Jamie? said, you're writing your own Docky Who story. News to you. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so confused. I was like, am yeah, I? Am so, I? So, um, but say you are. Okay, okay. Who's the Doctor? Who's mm-hmm. the companion? And mm-hmm. who's the villain? Ooh. Are you are you choosing an existing Doctor and Ooh. companion? Are you mixing it up? Are you mm-hmm. having a Doctor... And a companion who aren't usually together, or are you going completely new? And if you are, cast them. Mm. That's a tough one. I've mm. always had a. W- I'd always love to write for um, for Seven Silv McCoy. I don't know what it is. I feel the whole thing about him being manip. I love you know that whole angle about him being manipulative. Mm. Um, and I'd love to. I mean, so many writers have already explored it, but I'd love to have a go at that as well. So I'd say him, companion. I'd love it for. It sounds cruel, but I feel it could be dramatically interesting. If you take a companion who normally is so, like, like you know, jovial and say like Joe Grant, and then but yeah. he has to like manipulate events around her. And imagine her heartbreak when the man she trusts has had to do that. You know, it's oh. sort of like we get with Ace in Curse of Fenric when he yeah. sort of you know fake lies to her but it breaks her heart that the doctor's just said all that stuff about her and he's been pulling her along imagine that with someone like joe but i I think for dra you know obviously if it's written well and i don't claim to be a writer but if if i was to write it well i think that could be dramatically so interesting because joe's faith in the doctor is unshakable you know i think we can all agree Mm -hmm. on that she trusts but then but what if what if there's that one thing that could shake that even just do you know what i mean even just a little well, I yeah. think that could be really dramatically interesting. The villain, uh, I, I, let's go for a casting. I'd love to cast someone as a as a villain. Ooh, I'd, uh, I know he's always mooted for other stuff, but I think in the Doctor Who world, honestly, I think Idris Elba would make a great villain. Like mm. the villainous stuff he's done before in other things, I think is great. And just him, in, if he was like a version of the, I don't know, like the master or something, but even... Actually, I don't even want him to be the master. I want him to be another renegade time lord that I haven't got a name for. Yeah. But I don't know. I always want it to be a mix of like the master and maybe a more formal time lord. I don't, I don't know. Well, Just I was, some... I don't, as soon as you said it yourself, I thought there's a man who could play Omega. I think, there you go. I think that's there a great go. cast. How sick would that be? Like yeah. Idris Elba as Omega. Like, oh. That would be. That, let, let's go with that. So, you've got Seventh Doctor Joe Grant and Idris Elba as Omega, because then oh. obviously Joe's met Omega. So, oh, Josh, it's all, it's it's happening. It's We're happening. piecing this. It's, it's happening. It's well, yeah. Let's write it now. Let's write it. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, 
that was the end of the questions. Mm. I'm very, very sorry if we didn't get around to yours. Thank you for sending them all in. Every week, you're always chucking hundreds of <laughs> tweets at me with questions, and I love it. Um, so keep them coming. Keep them coming in the future. Um, but we're, 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 we're coming closer to the end of the show now. Oh. Uh, not 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 too far but you know yeah. you know so far yet so close <laughs> we've got something to talk about before we finish we do and that's of course it's the, it's the corridor of fame have you ever been limited by who you were before one day i shall come back yes i shall come back our lives are different that's the exciting tear. Yeah. Do I have the right? For some people, small, beautiful events is what life is all about. It's an anniversary compared to us. Ten million years of absolute power. That's what it takes to be really powerful. Every great decision came from the past. Like a huge boulder dropped in a lake. When it was a child, this dream that made you adopted. You dreamt you could no more. So, for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, where have you been? You know, living under a rock? God. Um, the Corridor of Fame is a Hall of Fame for Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we've got some some crackers in here. Crackers already. But I think we've got, we've got a little spot just around the corner of the corridor. Hmm. We've got an empty frame. There's a little placard waiting underneath. Yeah. Adam Martin is going to be <laughs> filling that frame. Hell yeah. Not with your face. No, no, no. You, I mean, not. if you want no, to, no, you can no. put yourself in. No, if you want. no, 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 no. Absolutely not. I wonder if anyone's going to do that one day. I mean, that'd be, that'd be ballsy. That'd be, it would to be say ballsy. the least, that'd be very ballsy. <laughs> I wonder who I would allow. I think there's some people I'd have to go. Mm, yeah. Let's have a chat. Yeah. Um, I mean, like if it was, I don't know. Well, Sophie Aldridge, she can put herself in issue. <laughs> yeah. It's up to her. Oh, I mean, her. but but let's not discuss that now. Let's discuss who you are going to be putting in the corridor of fame. Well, again, like the DVD collection, this is one of those things where you think you'd have someone pop straight in your head. And I think for some of you guests, they have. But for me, I had there's a few because obviously there's so many great people involved in Doctor Who over its near... 60 year history not you know not just actors production crew writers designer everyone everyone there's so many great people um mm-hmm. who i'm gonna pick is probably someone that i i think might surprise some people just because he, i don't hear his name talked often about but i really admire his work um just to to, <laughs> to build some unnecessary tension uh, it's someone who this. is. A, I love this, it, unne- this unnecessary. So it, it's, it's definitely good, yeah. necessary. <laughs> so it's someone who is associated with the McCoy era. So we're sticking with we're sticking with the late eighties there. Yeah. Um, it's not an actor involved in the show. Um, the person I am selecting is composer Kef McCulloch, who composed the theme tune for Sylvester McCoy's Doctor. And also did the soundtracks for stories like uh, uh, Time in the Rani, uh, Delta and the Bannerman, Remembrance, um, and a few and a few others in that era. I can't, they're not all springing to mind, but yeah, I'm going to go with Kef. That's a lovely pick. Lovely, yeah. lovely pick. I believe, if I remember correctly, our first composer um, since Delia Derbyshire that we've got Delia in. Yeah. But... We've got Kef in. We've um, got Kef. So, yeah, I mean, great theme. It's a great <laughs> oh, yeah. theme, isn't it? It's a, I love it so theme. much. And, I mean, but, it's it's still one of those. But, again, like, when I got into The Seventh Doctor, 
when I say people hated it, that included the theme. People were like, this is not a good theme. This is not Doctor Who. And I was like, I couldn't disagree more. I love like the yeah. the raging synth, as I call it. Like it sounds, it is, yeah, it is very of its time. You can tell it's from the late 80s, but I think that's what's so brilliant about it. It's so unashamedly of that era and it works. So like every time I, well, even when I hear it on things like Big Finish, you think like, it's like fantasy and wonder and excitement adventure with a little bit of like tension because there's a little bit of like oh what's gonna like all great doctor who things like oh what's gonna happen this time is a bit of like i don't recall it maybe like a bit of sinisterness to it not in like Mm. a bad way but like oh there's some danger here but um and yeah that in like the 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 actual intro i mean i like the tardis like twirling away in the middle mccoy the the way they did mccoy's face is brilliant i love it it's my favorite like classic doctor face in a title sequence sort of thing and you know what i love the logo for the seventh star i don't care what anyone i says. love it they say, oh, it's like the kellogg's one. i don't i don't care man it's so good it's well, so I, good i think we're both unashamedly fans of all things 80s i think yeah, we both, i think we we're on there yeah <laughs> love like the 80s aesthetic yeah absolutely absolutely and i mean yeah that logo is He's got, I'm getting away from the music, but the logo, the title sequence, I love it in a way, because I I do think, obviously, we were talking before about things that have aged poorly. Yeah. Um, I think, I think maybe it sort of has to go on the list. Um, I think, I think it's been, it's fallen victim to a little bit of CGI snobbery over the years. Yeah, yeah, Um, of course. But I, I don't think... You can argue with that with that theme. It's, no, absolutely. It's lovely. It is lovely. Like I say, I think it fell into it because, uh, yeah, the sequence. I think I think it was the first one to use CGI or like very primitive CGI back then. I mm-hmm. think it was the first one. Um, but yeah, like the theme. I just think it's. I just love, and I, there's the. Um, I don't know if it's on the. I don't think it is on the DVD on the VHS of Silver Nemesis. At the end, there is a American documentary that they filmed at the time, sort of, you know, about the making of uh, Silver Nemesis and stuff. And in that, there's an interview with Kef, and he he sort of explains a bit about, it's not very long, but it sort of explains a bit about his music making process, both for that story, he plays a bit of the, like, Remembrance soundtrack, and I think he plays a bit of the Doctor Who theme as well. And um, just as a composer, like, again, I have a lot of respect for him. Like, I don't know if people know, but for Paradise Towers, um, I can't remember the, there was meant to be someone else doing the music. I can't remember his name, which is really bad. But for whatever reason, I think the director decided they didn't like it in the end. Um, so Kef redid the whole soundtrack in about a week. And I love the Paradise Tower soundtrack, um, as I do all of his all of his stuff. Uh, I just remember Battlefield was one that he did as well. I think that was the last yeah. one um, he did as well. And um, yeah, I just, I just love it. I, I mean, I like to say, I am an unashamed 80s lover. Um, but yeah, I just think he's brilliant. And for some reason, there's not that much known about him. I was having a look before I came on. Um, it's really his Doctor Who work. And then um, he did Dimensions in Time, which is canon. Um, and <laughs> we'll start that argument. <laughs> and um, yeah, he did that. And then after that, there's not really much. Like his IMDb has not been updated much. There's not really any or many yeah. interviews with him. I don't, I, he might have, I don't think he's even popped up in Doctor Who magazine that much. Um, no. He does have a Myth Makers, for anyone who doesn't know, you know, the um, the guys that, I think it's BBV, or like Real Time Pictures who go around and have chats with people involved in the show. He did do one of those back in the day. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen it, but I'd love to find a copy of that and watch it. But yeah, I just think he gets bashed a lot, like even back when, like, you know, in 2005, and even now to some degree, you know, people are like, oh, the theme's horrible. And like, you can have your opinion. If you don't like it, that's fine. But I think there's a difference to not liking a theme and then denouncing his entire work as like trash and worthless. Yeah, I think that's definitely. that's a bit like, come on, that's a bit, that's a bit of a rubbish well, take to have, isn't I, it? I mean, yeah. I've pulled up, I've pulled up his, his, um, his his filmography here yeah um so yeah you, you can't you can't argue with it because yeah time in the rani paradise towers as you said written inside of a week to replace david snell's original score that's it um, yeah delta and the bannermen remembrance of the daleks silver nemesis obviously i had some scathing words earlier, <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know nothing against the music um battlefield the vhs Sharda release he also oh, yeah, did the okay. music for and dimensions in time yeah 
on and there's not a lot else in there. He also, I've just read, made an on-screen appearance as a band member of the Laurels in Delta yes. and so, in the Hit to the Future song. Yeah, so he's a uh, he's popped up, but yeah, I mean, you know, if Kef is, um, if he, if, you know, if he's if he's still out there, I hope he's you know doing all right. But it'd be great yeah. if he. I don't know. It'd be great if he was able to come back, even you know, for like a big finish thing or something like that, just to have another go at it. If he wants to, of course. But yeah, that he was be cool. He was just my pick because obviously, I think some other guests have mentioned as well. Like music is so important to Doctor Who, not just the theme tune, but like the music that goes along with the episodes. And mm-hmm. his his soundtrack just always really worked for me. You know, they, they dated as some elements of them might be. Um, they work for the stories, like the Remembrance soundtrack. My God. Like, I mean, yes, you can tell a lot of those instruments are like from a 80s, like drum machine or, a, you know, if you know, if you know, you like soundscapes and whatnot. Yeah, like, of course. But it, you can't deny, I think it fits the story really well. Like, you know, the scenes where they're running about or when the Daleks are attacking the motherships landed, so, you know, all that stuff. It just it fits it really, really well. Definitely. And it is a bit awkward because I know Delia Derbyshire, I think, said in interviews Basically, any I know the Peter Howell theme, and I think Kef's theme. She what she wasn't fans of, which is fair enough because obviously she composed the original, um, which is fine. Again, like you can have that opinion, um, but mm-hmm. I just I love it. I love it's my favorite Doctor Who theme. I'm not ashamed yeah. to say the Kef. McCoy. Well, I hope there's no animosity between the two in in the corridor. Yeah, you know, I'm sure they'll Julia be fine. And Kef. I'm I'm they'll, sure they'll they'll, they'll go for know, a little stroll and they'll and shake the, hands. They'll have a chat. Yeah, definitely. So. Because music's all about interpretation, I think. And, you know, yeah. we not every, like with Doctor in general, I think not every interpretation is going to agree with everyone. That's just, yeah. you can't please everyone. That's just facts. So, but yeah, but I'm very happy that his interpretation just clicked with me right right from the word go as a kid and now. So yeah, big yeah. up Kef McCulloch. Big up. And if, if Kef is out there listening, I doubt he is. <laughs> but if he is, and if he ever wants to have a chat, yeah, I would love to have him on the podcast. That would be a great <laughs> guest. Yeah. Because I bet he's got some stories to tell, especially that week writing oh God, Paradise Towers. I bet that was probably the, you know, the, the most chaotic week. Yeah. Ever. Um, lovely pick. Thank lovely, you, lovely pick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, that brings us to the end of the show. Mad. Um, yeah. It's been. It's been a lovely, lovely time. I mean, we've got one question left to ask Oh, before we go. Um, it's a question I ask all of my guests. Uh-huh. It doesn't have to be in a sentence. Just <laughs> roughly, you know, just yeah. go with the flow. In a sentence, though. Mm-hmm. Sentence. What does Doctor Who mean to you? Oh, yes, the big one. What does Doctor Who mean to me? Um, in a sentence, uh, Doctor Who to me means a sense of home, comma, <laughs> nostalgia, comma, and um, joy, just pure joy. That is a lovely answer. Thanks, man. A lovely, lovely answer. I had to cut a few commas out of there. Could you tell? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fine. That's 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 fine. And mm. it's been it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, where is. can people find you? Please plug away. Because as well, something that I forgot to mention earlier. I want to say a big congratulations on hitting thirteen thousand subscribers. Oh, mad man, thank you, thank you. That's it's unreal. That so is big unreal. Numbers, man. That is big numbers. 16 year old um, Adam with his Samsung Galaxy S2 never would have dreamed it, mate. Trust me. <laughs> oh, bless. Bless you. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah where, where can people find you? Go ahead. Well, um, your stuff. if you want to see the kind of content and videos I make, uh, just search Adam Martin on YouTube. That's Martin with a Y. I, I feel like I have to say that because every time I don't, people spell it with an I. Um, so, yeah, Adam Martin with a Y on YouTube. I should pop up. Um, I do videos on Doctor Who, but also as we've mentioned, like classic TV presentation slash history, also other things I'm interested in. Um, now that's what I call music stuff, uh, stuff about public information films. I do, a, I do a fair bit, let's put it that way. I'm sure there'll be something you'll hopefully enjoy. And um, if you want to see my daily ramblings, head over to our favourite bird app, Twitter, and uh, Adam Martin Actor. Uh, again, I should pop up there and 
give us a follow. I also do giveaways on the occasion uh, for free. You don't have to pay anything. Uh, usually giving away Doctor Who bits and bobs, uh, books, uh, DVDs, battles in time trading cards. Am I right? Oh, nice. I know a That's lot of you want bad. those. Um, but yeah, just um, have a follow if you want to keep in touch. And uh, yeah, that's it, really. That's it. Well, um, I mean, to, to to plug the pod, as usual, mm-hmm. you know, you can find Who Knew wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Uh, just type in Who Knew Tube, all one word, um, or it's in the description down below. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Josh Ryan Carr. You can find the podcast on Twitter, Who Knew Podcast. You can find me on Instagram, Who Knew Who Knew Who Knew DW Pod, and you can email us, Who Knew DW Pod at gmail.com. I have not rehearsed that enough. Um, oh God, that was that was a train wreck. Um, it's fine, but yeah, way. you can you can find us wherever. Um, but Adam Martin, thank you once again for coming on. It's been a joy. Nah, and to you, man, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I can't wait to see who's who's coming next. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs>